The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today, I'm joined by Jerry Kalajaropoulos and Philip Tafe. From uh, Aptium. Gentlemen, welcome to the Engine Room podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be here. It's been it's been a long time we've spoken about this. So And did I hit my first KPI, Jerry? Hang on. First got the enunciation no. correct. <laughs> I've got to admit. Awesome. Okay. So um for those of you guys who've done sales before, I've just skied down the top of the mountain, so there's very little that I'm gonna get wrong. So uh, a big shout out to uh, your Greek heritage, no doubt. Absolutely. It's not Irish. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. Mine is. <laughs> well, there, oh, there you go. So, look, we're, we're probably not going to go that far back. When I say, can I give you some background story? Let's not pull out Ancestry.com. We're not doing swabs of DNA, gentlemen. We're probably just going to talk about them. Now, on that, the best part of the engine room is getting to know how the hell you've got to be in a place today where you've got you know, a reasonable business. You've got a reasonable business. You've got lots of ambition. You've done some really clever things. You've probably also made some mistakes we'd love to learn from. Okay. So, maybe uh, if we start with yourself, uh, Phil, give us a bit of an idea of how you've come to be. Um, the principal advisor and, and, and boss of, of Aptium. Your Look, backstory. It definitely wasn't by design. Mine started back in the university days when I was wondering what I was going to do, probably heading towards an investment bank or something like that. And my dad was having lunch with his financial advisor while I was doing an honours year in finance at Sydney Uni. And the advisor said, oh, I need someone like that. Get him to come have a chat. And I kind of got stuck there. So first of all, you, you, your, your father had an engaged financial advisor. How many years ago was that, if you don't mind me asking? So he was made redundant from Qantas. He obviously went onto the website or the intranet or whatever it was back then in what it must have been 90s, mid 90s. Yeah, wow. And yeah, he was given some advice around the redundancy and that led, I guess, to my entire career. So I'm pretty thankful for it. You know what? Um, I look back and if you think the evolution of the financial advice industry, compulsory super, I think, kicked off in 92. But it was really sort of big retrenchments out of BHP, Qantas, et cetera, that, that probably stimulated the advice side. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I think the tie-up and certainly the, the advisor that I started with, it was through the union movement as well. There was some connection where there was a limited number of advisors listed and I guess it led to a fairly commercial arrangement even though it came through that union tie-up, I guess. So um, in the 90s, you, 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 did you finish your degree? Yeah, I finished it and then started off, I was big into athletics and so when I finished uni, they said, come work full-time. I said, no thanks, I'll give you part-time and I'm going to do athletics. That m- morphed into, you know. So what did you do? Tell me, we've got the uh, uh, the Olympics coming up. Um, obviously, you've, you've, you've taken time out of your busy pre-Paris schedule to uh, <laughs> to give us some time today, but what was your your, your, your uh, run in athletics? Uh, the middle distance is what I was into, the 800s and 1500s. Okay, so salamasochist, love it, love yeah. it. Okay, cool. So, yeah, but then that morphed into, you know, more full-time work, being asked to come start a business with with the original advisor I was working with. And then that morphed into self-employment, which I think is what's really kept me in the game because it's that business ownership element that's, I guess, driven my passion for continuing in the business rather than pure financial advice. 
reading your background, um, that was around 2004, was it? Yeah, I think 2003 when I started becoming self-employed and have just grown organically from then from a fairly small base, to be honest. And and, and I remember 2003 was the year in which uh, it was the, the fallout from the Royal Commission before the last one, which was the Rodney Adler FAI, I suppose, scandal. And that's when um, AFSL started effectively, 2003. So I, I know where you are now. I know the home that you've got now, which we'll talk about in due course. But um, what was the, you know, where did you go to to start your business? So I've always followed the path of least resistance, I think, and being, I guess, fairly conservative. I think I definitely could have taken more risks along the way. But having started with Lend Lease Financial Planning, which became Apogee Financial Planning, which has then morphed over into the NAB network and now uh, Consultum and Rhombus, you know, I really haven't changed throughout that process and just rolled with the punches, rightly or wrongly. So that's been the the pathway and we've just made the most of opportunities through that pathway. I'm aware of the alternatives, but have always just managed the business well and everything has gone fairly well that it hasn't really prompted me or forced me to make a change. So you um you kicked off um in the mid noughties. I was doing it as well. Some pretty easy years of investment returns, and then all of a sudden GSE happened. Give me a bit of a feel for um, you know what you were doing around there and what learnings you, you've got. So I came into this business where there was a real push to start incorporating direct investments, direct shares and things like that into portfolios. So we've already always been fairly, fairly active on that front. Never really run uh, strict model portfolios. Everything's quite tailored and bespoke. And a lot of people tell me that's very hands-on and you should be a little more consistent in your approach. We might get there one day, but again, to this point, I always like the the fact that we are tailoring things for each individual that comes to see us. Sure, there may be some commonality and some philosophies that are inbuilt into what we construct for them, but very much try and uh, tailor it for each individual. And um, did you keep the running up? Uh, it's morphed to cycling because, yeah, the knees said switch. But as you can tell by my skin and bones, I... Um, yeah, well, I, I, I think you could you could buy a few kgs from the host. <laughs> I'm willing to trade you a few. <laughs> to be real, yeah. So that's um. Uh, so I'm glad we're not actually videoing these ones. So uh, <laughs> so uh, now, um, what about uh, outside of uh, you know what? I like to ask the outside because financial planning's been tough, right? It's been tough to run a business, and quite often you need something else in your life, whether it be family, friends, hobbies. What else have you add to help you? The everything centers around family for me. So got a wife, I've got three kids ranging from 12 to 17. I love travel, I speak a bit of French and I do a lot of cycling. So um, July is a big month for you. Absolutely. I'll be heading over there shortly. So oh, wow. Well, wow, okay. Um, you know, all those things, if I can't fit those in, then business isn't going well. Forget the numbers. Yep. It's, it's that balance between lifestyle and, and business. Okay. And um, one of the, uh, I suppose, we, we talked off off uh, camera, off, off camera, off air rec- uh, earlier, and we went through sort of, you know, you very quickly said, oh, "I just, you know, myself and Jerry, I'm coming to you in a second, Jerry." Um, what our roles were, and and you mentioned that you know you, you're founder, advice led, client centric, and I can tell you that the smartest thing that you've done, and the part of the reason that the, the engine room exists is, it's those CEOs who realise what they weren't awesome at or they didn't want to do, who appointed people that have seen all the scale. You know the the people that are control freaks haven't. So congratulations, I suppose, straight off. There you go. You got a congratulations. In the Thank first you. I, I've definitely learned from watching other people make mistakes. Put it that oh, way. Do we want to it, talk about the other people who've made mistakes? Mm, no, we're just we're not probably gonna, <laughs> not going to name anyone. But I can tell you for a fact, I think I have learned more of my life's lessons from learning what not to do than seeing somebody do it perfectly. Well, well be, give us one. Give us one. So, uh, what's been something that you did in your business? I mean, um, Aptium itself is now seven or eight years old. Is that right? Um, well, no, 2003, really. Oh, so it's been the same name the whole way through. Uh, we changed trading name midway, but it was yep. the same business. Okay, so what, what's one of the things that you, one of the roads you went down that you, you, you've now gone, why did I do that? So on day one, I was constantly worried about, is this thing going to work? I'm going to be profitable. I'm going to be able to put food on the table for my family. So to that extent, I ran, a, uh, ran it on the smell of an oily rag, did a lot of the late night stuff myself, writing my own plans, working really hard. And I don't regret that at all, but I'm pretty sure looking back in hindsight, knowing that it was all going to go well, I probably could have taken a lot more risks and accelerated it much more quickly. Isn't that funny? Um, 
uh, I also share the same sentiments. Um, by the time I got to a stage where I sold my business, I was very, very non-leveraged yes. and, and would have been a good idea. I so- remember, Roxy, when I first met Phil, this is in 2010, his business was at that point turning over, oh, I don't know, it was not, yeah, maybe seven figures. Um, EBIT would have been, I don't know, north of 60% and he had no debt, I don't think, well, yep. certainly no business debt. Um, and was driving a Mitsubishi Mirage. <laughs> okay, so please consider no, no Mitsubishi. No, no staff doing everything himself, as he says, sitting in front of the television, and, you know, Sunday nights doing his own plans, um, and persisted that way for several years. Right after that initial sort of encounter, I was his practice manager with with MLC at the time, um, and I, I recall pushing him pretty hard for what felt like years to hire someone. He literally had no employees, so. So um, with yourself, Jerry, it'd be good to hear your background and you've actually just got to a juncture. Um, I love the fact that you had a free look at the guy for a couple of years, um, uh, you know, before you actually decided to do it, which is, which is you know, um, a really interesting way of doing it. But, but what, what's your background? And I believe we've crossed paths in the, in, in the past. Yeah. Yeah. We, we sort of joined the dots uh, a couple of months back. I remember when we sat on a, on a panel session um, with the insiders. But um, yeah, so my background is working in sort of large institutions for a long, long time. Um, did my years at Macquarie in the early sort of glory days of Macquarie Rap. That's where I sort of recall you working at Announcer. Um, so many, so many people who are influential and I believe, you know, um, great operators have come out of that Macquarie cohort in the in the mid uh, it was, a, it was Why a, is that, you think? I was Look, it was an awesome place to work at that particular time. I think guys that were running that part of the bank, Neil Roderick at the time, he's retired now, really hired people that were hired and I think um, gave people the authority to run the business like it was their own business. Freedom within boundaries. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, you know, my first job went there was on the phones in the call center. And I recall that I went through, it was either eight or nine interview stages for a phones job, right? Uh, oh, wow. In, in the Macquarie Rap call center. So, interviewed by several people, joint interviews, aptitude tests and rest. And it was obvious, like from the beginning, they hired people that were prepared to have a go, prepared to listen and learn and do things the way that they wanted to, but run it like it was their own business. So that was sort of, you know, I learned lots of lessons in that place and um, still in touch with, you know, I met with Tony Tony Jasmic, I think last week, who's now at um, Lonsec. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of all-stars that, that worked there over the years. Was that your, um, you know, you're not that old, but so was that your um, education? You did a sort of came out of school when to finance? What was your first passion? Uh, so came out of school, did a, a business degree at UTS and uh, got a uh, sort of graduate job with, believe it or not, British American Tobacco for a couple of years. So spent two years uh, there and then straight into financial services. So joined, yeah, Macquarie was pretty much the first place I worked um, for four years, worked as a BDM there for a little while and and only left, actually, to move overseas. You went with- to London, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I did. I went to London for four years with, uh, well, who's now my wife. So, at the time, we were sort of dating and that was her dream. She was a country girl that had sort of, we'd met in Sydney. Um, she grew up in um, Musselbrook and really wanted to see some of the world and that was her dream. So, we did it. So, I mean, I'm from the country as well. Going overseas normally means you drive over the Harbour Bridge, but um, <laughs> you actually took it at face value. Well played. <laughs> yeah, she... I think she worked at me for about two years to make that happen. In the end, I was the same sort of same page of the street directory sort of guy. I didn't really fancy doing that, but um, I think I asked her to marry me. Actually, she said yes, and then as an afterthought, I thought, "Oh crap!" Oh, conditional approval. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) she really only had one one dream, and I'd crushed it, right? So, um, yeah, so I sort of did a U turn on that. We moved over there for what meant to be a year, and ended up spending four years there um, working in amazing places. So I spent the whole time with AXA UK. Again, uh, with the rap platform there, trying to, to sort of grow that from scratch. Um, and you worked out what's an AXA? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I did. <laughs> there you go. And um, so then you've come back and, and you were working in, in various sort of business development roles within the Idle Earth umbrella for memory. Is that right? Well, MLC. So I joined MLC on my return and never left. So right. I only left there to, to join Phil um, last year. Okay. Yeah. Now, the engine room, I've got to ask this question. Why'd you pick him? Why'd you pick this business? Because- you know, if you're out of corporate and you're thinking, you're not looking at putting your toe in for a year or two, you've got to be thinking, I need somewhere to go for 10, 15 years plus. Why'd you pick him? Well, I can tell you, I planted the seed, I reckon, to begin with probably 10 years ago to say, Jerry, you know, I'd love to have you on board. 
but that conservative nature in me was, but I don't really want to pay for it. So I think over to you, Jerry, you probably then watched for the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my intention was always to work in an advice practice. I've always been a sort of square peg in a round hole to the extent that, you know, I'm passionate about small business and the contribution that small business has made to the world, right? Really? Like we've invented, you know, double entry accounting and we've invented banking and all sorts of other cool things, right? So I value, you know, the the industry, I guess, and the inventiveness of, of small business. And that was my mission. But it was, as you say, you know, when you work, work with many advisors, you've got you've got an opportunity to see lots of things that work really well and some that don't. And Phil was the automatic pick for me from the beginning, really, because um, you know, I really valued, first of all, his openness. Um, it was straightforward. His values sort of aligned with with mine. He was particularly sort of industrious and managed his business really, really. What, what do you mean by industrious? Well, what I mean is that um, he feels the sort of bloke that um, will run a business and master every aspect of his business and hone it to the best of his ability. And when he brings someone else in, he'll create a mini me. And and he did that with his very first hire. In fact, that that's led to all sorts of other cool things for us. But he's not scared to get his hands dirty and master every aspect of, of the business and nothing's beneath him. So there's no hierarchy. We'll get to our org structure sort of later on. But he's all about execution and getting things done. And I think he's, I mean, you sort of spoke about his background earlier on, but I think he consistently undersell, undersells what he does. Um and the impact that it has on our clients and on the business itself. Like it hasn't grown by mistake. There's something that in the water, right? Something we're doing right here. And I think it comes down to his ability to execute and get everyone else around him to do the same. Well, there's you start off with a bit of cultural DNA and then it's those business leaders that learn how to execute. And if they don't do it themselves, they learn how to surround themselves by people who can. Well, that's one of the lessons I've learned is there's a big distinction between being that great advisor and a great business owner. And I think that's one of those things I observed early on, one of those mistakes I was talking about that I saw other people make. Great advisors do exactly what they do, but gee, when you look behind under the hood with the business, could have been managed just so much better. And I found that really frustrating watching guys that should have been quite successful become financial basket cases. <laughs> well, my, my, my story was um, when I when I was taking an advisors um, in my practice, um, you know, initially I thought I was the number one advisor. Within five years, there were 12 advisors, I was the 13th best. So, um, you know, it is it is a humbling experience, mm. um, but I think that the sooner that you can do that or, or, or join up with, with, with specialists, they're better. Jerry, with yourself, um, what do you do outside of um, work? What's What sort of floats your boat? And... Um, uh, apart from, you know, going overseas and coming back and, um, yeah, give us a bit of a feel for, for yourself. So I think both Phil and I would consider ourselves to be pretty boring humans, happily married, but pretty boring. So we, look, I'm a family guy as well, two kids, two rabbits, uh, free range in the house, believe it or not. Um, I cycle as well. So over the years, we've we've done a lot of riding together here and overseas and represented Australia at one point in Masters. Oh, awesome. um, worlds and that kind of stuff and when was that that's interesting 2016 i reckon i've done a couple well, you've done a you've few done of them. one yeah. yeah okay so um yeah i like i couldn't work for you guys because i would fail the fold test someone's got to hand out the drinks <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> that's right that's a fun and organize the sponsors <laughs> uh well that, i mean that that's really interesting and it's good that you're passionate it's good to have that that balance because not only is our job it's hard to run financial services practices you've quite often you've had headwinds with legislation and clients can be tough you know people don't realize that half your job is being an unpaid psychologist um with families and and the wealthier they get and the more complicated the the bigger the problems quite often you talk about those headwinds but i have to say what i do day to day is no different today than what i was doing 20 years ago hilarious so i i challenge you this i did the same exercise um back in 1997 i started going feed for service and i looked at a couple came in 35-year-old couple that came in, I gave roughly the same recommendation, cash flow, consolidation, insurance, et cetera. I could charge $1,200. I looked at one in 2010, almost the same. And then I look now at what people have got to do for the same person. They're getting no change out of 5000 And so what that means is that, yeah, I mean- It's the documentation, advice. it's good the advice, checklist. That's advice. what yeah, changes, yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly right. But that's where you have to be willing to roll the punches- be malleable, efficient, change what you do daily to be able to keep doing the same advice but remaining compliant and doing it 
Yeah, and look, we're becoming, like people say, we're becoming professional. I don't think that means we're doing more. I think we always eat stuff. It just means we're scoping better mm. um, and we're acknowledging the bits we can't do. Now, um, maybe talk, talking about, well, first of all, thanks very much for, for opening up there. I'd, um, I, I Obviously, two athletes in the room, it's um, it's quite intimidating for me, but I'll see if I, I can push forward. Just give me one sec. I've just got a cookie to eat. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, changing gears a bit, well, it'd be good to hear about, um, you know, how you've run your practice today. You know, it's 2024. Um, yeah, ha- how do you organise yourself? Maybe we'll kick off with yourself, Terry. You've come in, you're a year in. Um, if you're not on top of this, then we've got a problem. So, yeah, what's the org structure um, to start sure. with? And then maybe uh, if I can jump over to yourself to talk about the type of clients. Mm-hmm. And then then back to yourself, Terry, on, you know, how you then run run sort of the cadence of, of success with your advisors and yeah, sure. Um, so you've got a few advisors. I'm looking at your website. It's quite a big business. Uh, getting there. Yeah, getting there. So we, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll start with, first of all, our approach to things because we are a little bit unique in the way that we organize ourselves, but there's a, a reason for that. So I think, um, yeah, first thing is I would describe this practice as, as very much no-nonsense, uh, pragmatic, industrious, again, like like our founder, I guess, um, but laser-focused on getting stuff done and and you know, some of the stats kind of exhibit that. So we manage, well, up until a month ago, we were managing, you know, 500 odd client reviews annually between Phil and one other advisor. Wow. Okay. So that's that's double the commonly accepted metrics that I see. Pr- pretty much. And, and these are clients, um, you know, we don't, uh, you know, play in one part of the market. We've got roughly the same number of clients for every sort of 10 year age bracket, I would say from 30 to 40 through to 70 to 80. Okay. So it's a it's a very sort of even spread of, of demographics and the advice is comprehensive, right? So it's not as though we're doing five minute reviews and they're sitting in a master trust and nothing's changed. These are, you know, there are sort of changes uh, ongoing for every client. So uh, about a month ago, we hired a third advisor. We have two client service managers as well onshore and that is it. So thanks for sort of outlining um, what you've got going on in your business uh, in this country. But we spoke previously off off air that you've got uh, a, a pretty significant offshore capability these days. Maybe tell me about uh, sort of how you arrived at that because it is a bit of a story and where you see it going from here. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we, we have quite a team uh, based in Vietnam. Initially, it was uh, Philip's own back office. So, it was really something that sort of developed circumstantially. We never intended to build a back office or outsourced um, back office available to other advisors, but effectively what happened was Phil had his first employee, um, trained him from woe to go. Uh, he was a uni student based in Australia. This w- is Justin, yeah? It is. Justin Vu is his name. So he was a uh, Vietnamese guy out here, had studied two degrees um, and was living here for 10 years, had settled permanently effectively, um, trained him to be an advisor, doing everything from admin to power planning to strategy and the rest, and sort of five years into his Employ, employment journey, he sort of said, look, I'm marrying someone and we want to have a family back home, so we're, we're going to have to move back. And at that point, Philip sort of- Yeah, I think most businesses probably would have said, shake hands, good luck. Whereas I came back on the Monday morning going, why don't you keep working for me? Yeah, and that's what thinking, kind of, like it. Well, it was pre, you know, the, pre-COVID, so working from home and remotely was not quite the common thing. But we were, you know, we were paperless in the cloud, set up for it. So I thought, why not? But actually, the line I used to him was, mate- I don't mind if you find people to do the work for you over there and you're drinking pina coladas on the beach. If that works for you, great. And then he was never going to do that. So basically he worked hard and but ran with that strategy of finding people and we grew it from there. What year was that? Uh, that would have been, geez, 2000 and- 16 or 17. Yeah, about that. <laughs> and um, so- I have a, a similar kind of um, a story in, in my mortgage broking land, one of- one of our friends is a, a Serbian um, chap who's a Serbian Australian, and um, he ended up getting, I think it was one of his relatives doing some work in in Belgrave. And before you know it, he had a, a back office operation for mortgage breakings in Serbia. So it feels like it was that, but this was just specifically for your for your firm. Yeah, and which, uh, which would have been great for quality assurance, having someone who you trained in Australia to then sort of head that up. Absolutely, and also in terms of the business itself, I didn't want to get. Uh, I don't want to complicate things. You know, when you talk about outsourced and counting the number of advice documents you produce and was that simple or complex? So for me, it was very much designed around, I don't know, these guys are like an employee, needs to be a fixed cost and they 
they do the work and sometimes the work that they have to do is all different or outside the outside the box but that's just part of it uh, and so we've continued with that model really up to this day to try and make it a little more homogenous for businesses but it, but it sounds like you made it work for yourself and then you went whoa this might be something more to this is that right Jerry well the fact that it was not by design, something for other practices. It was, you know, we're a high efficiency kind of business. I think most people that know us would would agree. Um, we designed something that was fit for purpose for a, for a practice that, you know, operates at on average, you know, well over two hundred clients per advisor reviewed every year. That sort of capability, where you know you've got highly um, educated and trained people delivering high quality work. Our expectations are, of them are, are extremely high as well. I guess so. That kind of worked for us and it was always going to work for other practices that the challenge was, would the opportunity arise or not? And given we were part of a, a relatively large licensee, other sort of advisors cottoned on pretty quickly and um, they, they sort of approached us in some ways at the beginning. Um, and we thought, right, oh, well, we've got the capacity. We'll, we'll try this out and test it. And it worked pretty much immediately. Oh, great. Right. And, what, and what's the name of the, the, the back office? It's called Aptium Assist for no other great reason than it was assisting my business. Very low marketing budget spent on that. (laughs) But we have, well, we don't market it really over here, but in Vietnam, there's a wonderful, great big uh, banner up in the office. It's it's, uh, get the talent, right? It's it's a war for talent overseas as well. So now when you you mentioned just then that you you do run 200 clients and I, I get to see a lot of businesses and 150 is normally the area where people are at the top end. Um, and yet, when you look at the P&L, the way in which fixed costs are, every client or every dollar of revenue you get above that really is top line, bottom line stuff. So, how did you get to, you know, what what is your advice process? Maybe just to outline uh, what you guys do in your business as second nature that um, has allowed you to get to 200, which is one every working day. Uh, I'm going to let Jerry answer it because- I'm the guy that just does it. He's the outsider that I think has the view and from his practice development days sees maybe what we're doing and how it's different to other businesses. Yeah. Well, look, from my point of view, um, you know, like every small advice practice starts out with one advisor, right? And both the values and the way of working of an advice business, and it tends to sort of transmit across your employees, your first one, two, three employees. Obviously, things change when you get to 10, 15, 20. You've got more layers of um, of management and so on and so forth. But in our practice, you know, Phil started out as a, you know, extremely efficiency-focused kind of industrious operator that managed, I mean, before he put Justin on board, his very first employee, I think he was up to well over 200 clients himself with no staff, doing all his own plans, all his own admin, um, literally staying up on a Sunday night in front of the TV getting work done, right? So hard work and getting stuff done is just in our DNA. Um, so at the end of the day, in terms of our, of our advice process, advisors today, given the back office capability that we've got, you know, over 30 people in, in Vietnam, you know, advisors review clients or see new clients. Yep. They do their typical uh, file noting around that and that's kind of it. So- you know, our back office team can take a file note and produce advice from that. There is no power planning request forms. Our back office team talk to, as in the power planners, talk to our admin staff over there. So, implementation is pretty seamless. We do have two onshore um, client service managers and their their role really is to act as that middle person, the traffic controller between the advice team and the admin team. It's funny you should say that. When, I, when people ask me sort of how, how do practices do it, I say, well, you've got to have a logistics manager, mm. someone. Yeah. And you, yeah. Instead of you're not pushing trucks around, you're pushing information around, and and you need to make sure that the trucks aren't waiting for people too long, that there's petrol in them, and that they're getting the goods to the right thing. And you have to have that that minded person, which you've got in Australia. And about. and for a smaller business or a one man band, that will be the advisor. Yeah. It's just as you get larger, you need to have a specialist in that role. I think. Well, can I ask a question? Um, you've got your third advisor coming on, as you, as you mentioned. Um, and there, and, and so I suppose one of the sales points that you guys make amongst a bunch of other things you do when they come to you is we're going to buy you some more time to do the things you love. That'd be right. Yes. Part of it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think as a percentage of their other, of, of their time, do they get back by joining you and entering into this system as, as just to throw it out there? 50%. Yeah. Good answer. And which is amazing, right? So if they're struggling at 100 clients and you give them back 50%, it 
Yeah. If Sarah was power, she'd get 200. So for everyone out there listening, okay, people who are doing high productivity aren't working 28 hours a day. You just can't. I think, Jerry, you intimated that that's not a sustainable structure. You have to buy capability and time, and you either have to build it, borrow it, or buy it. And, exactly. And you guys built your own, and now you're allowing other people to, to borrow it for, for a fee, yeah? And exactly. I think it's important to point out that doesn't mean cutting corners. That doesn't mean knowing your client any less well. You have to know that. And when they call you, you better know who they are and what they've got and who their kids are. Yep. So you've got more time. You've got twice as much time to have all this information, right? Sure. Because you haven't had to do the 55th disclosure document um, that's probably send your brain numb. So, um, And in relation to you, have any other sort of uh, any other third party um, contractors that operate in your business at all? No, not at all. And how are you licensed? So we're licensed, uh, well, initially we were licensed through the MLC network yep. uh, with Apogee Financial Planning. Uh, MLC obviously was was acquired by IOOF a couple of years back and we've sort of gone with the flow since then. So we're currently licensed with Consultant, but we've never really changed licensee from, from the beginning. We're pro- I'm probably not the best person to ask about licenses because I've never seen the other side of the fence. You've always been there? Yes, yep. since 2000 and, well, so actually late 1999, I think it was Lend-Lease Financial Planning. Wow. And then my business started up in like 2003, 4, 5, which would have been Apogee at the time. I think 2003 is when they brought the new AFSL regime in. I remember getting my my first self-licensed AFSL back then. And um, um, so, yeah, it's, it's a long time ago. They were called dealer groups or something like that mm-hmm. before that. From the yeah, yep. Um And uh, so- uh, your licensee is also going through some changes as well. So, um, Massive, you know, yeah. they're, 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 uh, I've got a lot of exposure to the RI and consultant network. And um, I must say that, that of all the large uh, licensees, he's, they, what's the best way of gauging this? And for everyone who's listening who's uh, in there, um, they complain the least about their licensee, which is a good thing, right? So, so I think that's my judge normally when I talk to practice owners about their licensee, if they say nothing. Or they, or they say they've been there for a long time. That's almost a gold star, right? But- I always, I never know what to answer when they send you those marketing surveys. And at a scale of one to ten, would you refer us to your mates? It's kind of like, yeah, I'm on the fence in the middle. It's just not some some days, yes. some days. So um, uh, they're going through a new co, and I think they're you know detaching from institutional ownership. Um, and um, you know that's that's I think playing out over the next year or so. Is that right? This month, actually, this month. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, rhombus. Rhombus Advisory is the new new co. Ah, very good, very good. Well, um, shout out to all the Rhombus people there and all the people that are about to be branded as a Rhombus practice. Now, um, on that, yes, you've got an engine room. Yes, you've got people. You've got systems and processes. But one of our other stakeholders are some of the platforms and product providers that we choose to do business with. Is there any out there that you enjoy working with, that you, you, you use a lot, and that you, is now is a great forum to give them a shout out? Because yet again, they often don't get those. No, that's a good call. So I'd say yes to both. So there are some that we use a lot, and there are some that we love working with, and there is some crossover there. So um, yeah, we've worked with the MLC team in terms of MLC wrap for many, many years. That's now expand. It's an it's a insignia product. So again, there's been a bit of change there. Um, but much of our business relies on that, and they've they've been good supporters of ours over the years. So shout out to those guys. Um, but also, I would say um, a massive shout out to the crew at CFS. Um, so Michelle Creek, the state manager in, in New South Wales, has been awesome in terms of really understanding what partnership looks like. And Michelle listens to these. She told me. I bet she does. <laughs> She's been listening for 48 weeks waiting for her name to come out. So oh, big shout out. Michelle. She's a good operator and we've got sort of a common um, ex-Macquarie DNA. So yeah, a lot, lot in common with, with Michelle. And then I would add to that uh, on the Australian super side, on the you know industry, industry funds, they've, they've actually been great to deal with. Why? Why are they great to deal with? Uh, proactively, they came to me actually and said, listen, uh, we've noted that you've got a lot of accounts with us. Mm-hmm. Um, who are you? What do you do? And got to know us and did the due diligence. And, you know, they've got a, obviously a referral and clients calling all the time. So, you know. Is that, they, has that been fruitful? But yeah, it's fruitful. I mean, I certainly don't rely on it. Most of our business is word of mouth and client referrals. Uh, but I'm just impressed that they came to us proactively, which is often a rarity. It's normally would be us chasing things from from other businesses rather than the reverse. Well, I think they're running out of people to do the advice bit. True. They are. And um, I mean, to add to that, the other aspect I, I like about the Oz Super crew is that they genuinely have an interest in advice. 
both from an um, well from an advice point of view in terms of referring clients where they need help they will actively um, refer to to practitioners but also in terms of product development I mean they're sort of starting to play in the retirement income sort of space and looking to launch something in the new year um, they are absolutely talking to advisors around the development of their of their products as well which I think is pretty cool so if you're an advisor listening to this um, uh, there's a massive pool of clients there and it's probably worth your effort um, in reaching out and being proactive rather than reactive with them. And I've got to just harp back on one thing. You mentioned you're, you're working with the CFS team, but they have gone under a big uh, sort of transformation in the last couple of years and they've brought out yeah, their, their new down. offering edge. That's right. Yep. Um, and is that is that something that you guys are, are moving into or, or? We've been doing our due diligence. We've started opening accounts. You know, I'm never going to be the, the first adopter of anything and certainly not... A, wholesale mm. but we are absolutely starting to uh, to trial and test the waters and give some support because certainly from what my staff have seen and they've done all the the test cases and demonstrations and now opening accounts they find the functionality really user friendly yep i think the biggest issue with some of these platforms is compliance catching up to the technology because tech exists to do all these sorts of things and yet compliance says no we won't let you use that just yet so from that perspective, I can't wait till every bit of functionality is available to us. That's right. It's been a disastrous 10 years for um, for, for compliance and technology uh, because the regulations have changed faster than they can code. Mm. So I feel that even though there's been indecision on the um, QAR, I feel that the no decision over the last two years has probably given everyone's sort of dev team enough time to actually complete and get a lot of those one percenters that make it easy for your engineering to deal with. Now on that... Um, what's your tech stack, guys? It's pretty simple. Um, we, I mean, we look at technology as something to solve problems and that's it. We don't look for the technology before we've got a problem identified. And so for us, really, the only things that we need to solve for is workflow. And so in terms of workflow, we don't use Xplan. We don't use threads or anything like that. We've identified monday.com as a great substitute for that. Um, and that allows us to not just manage workflow with our own team, as an advice business, but for every other advice business that we support from an outsourcing point of view, Monday allows us to absolutely um, sort of dovetail into their existing processes. So it's something that, um, you know, it's technology that sits in the background that allows us to do our job and work in a really process oriented sort of fashion, but it doesn't impede on anyone else. We don't um, mandate that anyone else use it. Our back office uses it. It allows us to get work done and, and but, work. But I bet they typically take your advice. Would that be right? Pretty much. I think most practices that we operate with from our outsourcing point of view, we we work the way that they want to work on yeah. day one. Yeah. But on day 10, yeah. they sort of cotton on to better ways of doing things. It's, and yeah, it, it's yeah. funny how financial planners and, and, and tech stacks are funny thing. I mean, you mentioned, Phil, that um, uh, you don't want to be the first doing things and it feels like a new piece of tech in financial planning every two minutes. Mm. Um, but getting that tech stack right, and, and Monday is dot com is is not a financial planning um, specific one. It's it's a generalist. It's probably well funded. Um, you know, uh, that's that's in. What about what other? Um, well, tech I, is? I, I noticed I started with Monday simply because, like I said, we are really action oriented. So workflow is important to us. I didn't start with X Plan. I didn't start with Microsoft. But obviously, those bookend sort of that last one I've heard of Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we use the whole Microsoft suite. We. It's so good. Um, it really is. Awesome. I mean, I but but uh, if I was to look in the last ten years, it has won the war in our industry. Of um, Microsoft Teams is awesome. Copilot um, is awesome. Oh, um, we live on Teams. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And and when you say that, do you? Oh, can I ask some questions about Teams? Because you guys um, are your unique position, and you you own your own back office, right? So so. Do you utilize uh, groupings in your team? So how do, how does that arrange, and and what what works best? We utilize everything. So, yes, groupings. Um, so, we've got a thousand groups going on. Um, we use it for calls as well. We don't actually use our phones. As in, we call each other on Teams. Um, we use that Teams. That sounds doom, 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 Yeah, yeah, doom, 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 exactly. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I'm sure you can change that. <laughs> actually, um, for anyone out there, if you want to, uh, you know, give us a call, we'd like to know how. Because, um, you know, I wake up sometimes at night hearing that doom, doom, It's doom. a funny thing. Um yeah, and in a, in a practical sense, we've got, um, you know, as an advice business, we've got a couple of calls daily. So, 9 a.m. Teams call, 
is our advice team goes for five or 10 minutes just to set up the day and work out what's what. 12 p.m. call daily, again, five or 10 minutes. That's our back office team getting together. Um, so our sort of client service managers, the traffic controllers that we sort of mentioned um, with our admin team offshore and the local team sort of, again, planning the day, working out what's what. And yeah, all of that's on on, on team. So we also use it because I allow a, a huge amount of flexibility in terms of work from home. And so I encourage the guys, you need to act as if you're sitting side by side with each other. So if you're going to turn left or right and have a quick chat to someone and ask them a question, that's what Teams is for. Don't hesitate to make the call. I mean, Pete in our office prefaces every call to me. Oh, sorry. It's just, I'll make it quick. It's like, mate, don't be sorry. Call me every single time you think of something and just want to ask it because that's the only way we're going to stay connected if we're working remotely. Now, you mentioned the F. Phil, you, you said you're flexible in where people work, but you don't build a business that's successful being sort of lackadaisical regarding meeting rhythms. These meetings that you have, the advisor and whatnot, they're non-negotiable, I imagine. It's expected that people have to be there on time. It, it's not a place for excuses. Would that be fair? Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah, unless there's a you know meeting booked and someone – but we know that. We can see it in the diary. That's right. That's right. And, and t- take me through the – because they're otherwise known as daily huddles, right? So well, pe- people have um, – um, you know, most business coaches these days are sort of underpin sort of those daily huddle styles. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of the daily huddles and the rhythms and the critical numbers and those sorts of things. Um, what is it that you do with your advisors? Because it's only how many minutes long is that? Uh, it will vary. I mean, I, I can probably talk about the morning one. Yeah, let's do that. Because, start with you, Phil. I mean, that started off with COVID when I was you know, walking the dog around the park with earphones in and, you know, to keep everyone moving. So that often ended up becoming a little long-winded because we'd be catching up and saying g'day. So more recently, I've actually outsourced that responsibility to Pete to say, right, this needs to become a bit more disciplined. Yep. And he basically hits each person with- What are the questions? What What's sitting in your inbox today? Yep. What tasks did you miss yesterday? And what are you doing when we hang up, basically? Yeah. Well, and so, Okay. So what are your priorities? Um, how can I solve it? And what are you going to start with? Yep. A bit of- the last bit's a bit of like call to arms, isn't it? Absolutely. And there'll obviously be some prioritization in there because I then might jump in and say, guys, in order of priority, forget those two things, put them to the end of the day. I need you to not get a response on on, on this particular thing immediately. So, it, yeah, it just allows some prioritization, I think. And with all of us in the room, otherwise, when we're all corresponding individually, everyone you know, will, will think their thing is the most important. And then somebody gets overwhelmed saying, well, they told me to do this and you told me to do that. So just getting us in the room for five minutes together to address that kind of solves any issues. And from my experience with with, with offshoring, if you don't have a really structured way of telling them what to do, they struggle to say no. So if if all all your advisors asked them that this is the most important thing, they, you know, and I suppose over to you, Jerry, how how does does that that, um, middle of the day sort of back office conversation go? When um, to, to try and prioritise not just the work, but given you're putting more and more advisors on, I mean, the guy yeah. I'm talking to here can't get priority number one all the time. Is that right, Phil? Or not? Or no, he probably can. But um, as you get bigger, you know, how do you prioritise? Yeah, well, um, the right linkages have to be um, in place, right? So we've got advisors that are seeing clients, either new or review clients. We've got our client service managers who are onshore that are in contact with those guys and they are controlling the flow of work. So if it's getting ready for a review, it's making sure that the offshore team have got whatever needs to be uh, done prepared. You've got a question? Yes. How far before the review do you kick off the workflow? So, yeah, like days, weeks, months? Well, three months because yeah. we're working to 12-month client service agreements. So we'll have that notification come up three months in advance. That triggers a process and... That doesn't mean the review happens right then, but that client might lock it in in, you know, Tuesday in three weeks' time. Yep. The due date gets set for the offshore team to say the material must be ready the day before. The countdown clock. Before that, basically. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do you use like a calendar system? Are we using X-Plan for all those bookings? Well, for the notifications on when all the expiries are coming up. And then that flips to the Monday system to set up the review uh, process. Perfect. So, back to your meeting. Um, yes. Great. So that that sort of linkage between advisor and client service manager has to be correct so that we know that the order and priority of work is happening. But but really all of this stuff, like Phil said, is 
kind of codified in monday.com. So these processes are baked in that we've set for our practice and they're often quite different for every other practice we support as well, but they all sort of link with the right calendar and X plan so that nothing is missed. So a big part of what we're responsible for as a back office provider is making sure that that cycle of reviews is happening on time every time and um, working in a fixed term agreement environment means that you've got to get it right. Otherwise, you risk a client sort of tipping over that 12 month period. That's right. And without also, service. Also, um, it's the valuation of your business, right? It's just, uh, so you've got to, you know, you'd, you'd make sure your house was painted. So, um, yeah. But in terms of the, the, the midday meeting, that, that is a bit different. So it is very much client service managers dealing with the admin staff around exactly what people are responsible for in terms of their tasks. All of that stuff is very easily and um, sort of viewed on on Monday. So you know what's in your sort of list, your task list, you know what's overdue, you know what's on time, you know what's ahead of time and so forth. So we're just making sure we, we manage that work. It's it also to ensure things aren't missed because I am the biggest culprit of firing emails around to everybody saying, do this, do this, do that. And then I hang up and I worry that, oh, what if they don't see that email or it gets missed? So send them an email to, to read the email? No, now it's got to go under the Monday. Ah, beautiful. If it's on there, it's allocated to someone Source with a due date and everybody can see what's flashing up and who's yeah. responsible. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Now, when, I was going to ask, in relation to um, your operations and your advisors, do you run a pod system where you've got dedicated people to uh, an advisor or is it sort of a more of a pooled? Yeah, no, it is a pod system. So we, um, from the very, very outset, um, that experience that Phil went through where his key staff member sort of decided to move and intended to leave the business, actually. Um, you know, it's a real eye-opener in terms of key person risk. And so the way we've developed our back office for everyone that we work with is that that key risk just simply doesn't exist. Um, so every practice, be it a sole practitioner or whatever else, has always got at least two sets of eyes on that practice. So a couple of power planners, and it's the same two power planners always doing that work for that. Um, so they get familiarity. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're, they're, a, they're within normally a pot of eight with it, a team leader. So you probably have more eyes over it, it than even that. It, exactly. And if ever we wanted, I mean, we operate as a bit of a guinea pig, frankly, in our um, back office um, operation in that new staff um, get trained up on our business. So we're in fact dealing with the least experienced back office staff. And as they get more experienced and more capable, then we release them to other practices I as we grow. So, you're the, guinea, you're the petri dish. Yeah. The guinea pigs. Yeah. That. So, um, in relation to the, you, I mean, you, you very graciously, you're in my office. We're in Pitt Street, Sydney, for everyone listening for the first time. Um, you guys are 100 metres from this office. Is that where most of your clients are located? Is that where most of your Australian, I know they can work from home, but is, is that your office location? It officially is. I mean, I've always said the city is just kind of the uh, equally inconvenient for everyone. That's why for staff and clients. But the ratio of clients that would come in for reviews and things like that these days might be 5% of the client base. Oh, really? 95% would be more frequent contact throughout the year over phone or Teams or unsolicited contact from us to do things. So, that concept of a big annual three-hour meeting and go through everything, it, it's, it's becoming a little non-existent. Uh, yeah, new clients. New clients, again, in their hands. Want to come to the city? We're here. Want to meet in North Sydney at another place we've got over there? Meet you there. Want to talk on Teams or on the phone? You tell me. It, it, I can get the work done however you want it done. You know, it's outrageous. Times have changed in, in the in the noughties in my financial planning business. My, my big uh, kind of innovation was that we had a childcare facility so parents with kids could come in, book their kid into our childcare facility on the weekends for two or three hours. If only I had Teams or Zoom, I wouldn't have to bother. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I think for, for a lot of, I mean, I've worked with advisors for many, many years, just, just like yourself, Roxy. And I think for a lot of advisors, the concept of, you know, 95% of your reviews being, being done over the phone or Teams actually might be a bit scary, I think. You know, that you kind of, you know, this concept of I've got to have the client in and there's got to be an experience, they've got to see my beautiful office and so on and so forth. Again, that doesn't exist with us. We, you know, our office is not flash. You know, it's just a, it's a shared sort of services space in the city. You know, we back ourselves on the quality of the work that we do and not the client experience in inverted commas. Now, that might sound a little bit naive, but at the end of the day, our track record in terms of client growth has been consistent over 18 years. 
Like for, I've not met another advisor that's sort of gone from 30 clients to over 500 review clients organically over that period of time. It's just, it's absurd sort of numbers. So Phil's doing something right. The challenge for us is how do we replicate that, you know, that experience with other advisors in the practice, which is, as you know, not that easy. So, you know, Grandma Phil's, that'd be a scary exactly. concept for the, uh, the business meetings. But when, you, when you look at face to face versus, you know, digital connection, I mean, the one of the biggest improvements for us has been now the acceptance of digital signatures. Hallelujah. I, I heard another a business that we were talking to the other day, an advisor saying just how much time she spent uh, doing SOA presentation meetings and getting paperwork signed. And I was like, well, I don't do that often because it's a digital signature goes out, insert all, and there it is. I did a meeting last night with a new client where paper-based, face-to-face, and it literally was that two and a half hours and step through every line item. And I that's important for free and informed consent and all the rest, but it really takes a lot, lot longer than if you harness technology where it can be used. That's right. And look, clients and, and consumers in general, you know, the stakeholder that we may ignore from time to time in financial planning when we enable gaze, they want the experience that they last had. You know, if they're docu signing to get their air conditioning fixed, they're, if they're if they're if their um, dentist is sending them a link to set up meetings, that's what they expect. So for, for us to call ourselves professionals and not be it at at least that level of frictionless technology was always quite hilarious. I, I'm, I think COVID has done us, uh, you know, a massive it, it has done, it really has. And, and it used to be that you had to build a big office because for a while there, it was all about us and the clients were part of the care system. And it's definitely spun that it's all about the client. So um, you're right. I mean, value is value and, and they don't need the, the marble staircase. No, they don't. And I really do think that, yeah, COVID, I feel would agree, was a massive eye-opener for us in that once the clients had the option of Teams or phone or whatever, they took that immediately um, and nothing's changed at all, I would say, in terms of the work that we're doing or anything like no, that. No, I think we've just run on with that and that's how we now operate. And it's not that we don't operate off of the alternative. It's just that, again, 95% of people seem to be more than content doing it the other way. I've got a question I'm on one of the pages I'm just about to ask you, and I've jumped ahead. I like this question. Um, with the gift of hindsight, you know, what's been the one mistake or rabbit hole that you guys have gone down, in particular, Phil, over the years, that you've learned the most from? So maybe give us an idea of what, what that, that rabbit hole or mistake was and, and what you've learned from it, because it's the whole reason I do this podcast is to fast track other people for the mistakes that everyone else made. Over to you. Oh, look, for me, it's not going down the rabbit hole. That was the mistake. Oh, to tell. You know, take more risk. Don't so, be so conservative. So when, when were you conservative when you should have taken risks? Day one, you know, never knew where the next client was going to come from. Worried about the business. What if I lose a client? Don't borrow too much. Managing it. If I knew with hindsight that everything would play out nicely, my goodness, you would have acquired more businesses. You would have brought in more advisors, more support sooner. Don't sit up late at night writing all my own plans. Get someone in because that, what I've learned is every time I involve somebody else in the business, on the assumption that that's going to free up my time and give me more of my life back, no, it doesn't. It just accelerates the business and it takes it to the next level. So if I'd done that a little earlier, I think I might, I mean, I think I just would have got to where we are now much sooner. Um, I, mean, I started with a guy called Ian Tonkinson. He was my dad's financial advisor. Uh, my dad was being made redundant from Qantas. That's how they met. Uh, I was introduced because, yep, at a meeting, you know, I was at uni. Ian said, oh, I need someone like that. Get him to come have a chat. So that's how that started. And I would argue that Ian relied on myself and his daughter pretty much for everything. Between the two of us, advice and uh, uh, implementation, and his job was really just to have a chat to the clients and go to lunch. I took the other viewpoint, which when I started, I wanted to work a full day. I wanted to, you know, not do the long lunches and I didn't want to make things too complex either. My view was always, I'd be quite happy if it was just me and a couple of people supporting me one day. What a dream. I created something. And then I think it was more just having to deal with things as the business grew. You're confronted with- Was there a moment that you decided to- Change gears. I mean, you're here now because you did. Because life was good, almost too good, yet I was working really, really hard. Yeah, and you're probably, you get it, as a sort of a stage in your family where there's a stage in everyone's career where you've got a bit more time, then there's a stage where time evaporates. For everyone listening, 
now. If uh, if you're listening um, to this and you're uh, pushing a stroller, driving kids to sport, you know exactly <laughs> when time evaporates. <clears throat> and so, um, and I've always had that good balance. I mean, I've never missed a, a, a kid's school event or you know Father's Day event or drop off or any of that. So for me, that's almost the litmus test for. Do I have the balance right? If if one of my kids ever says, Dad, could you take me to that? If I ever say no, the, the balance is out of whack. Well, uh, you know, we're sort of touching on people and culture at the moment. And, <clears throat> and what I wanted to sort of move into at the moment is we've spent a fair bit of uh, the, the last little while of this, this podcast talking about your operations, your, you know, your efficiency, uh, this platform that you've built, right? Which is wonderful. But what I'd like to do is ask the following question. Now, why do people join you? Why do they stay and how do they grow, first and foremost? Because you're looking to build a platform to scale up the number of advisors. Is that right, guys? Yeah, I think so. Why do they join you? If I'm an advisor and I'm listening to this and I like what I hear so far about efficiencies and back office and that bloody 50% you get back sounds good, but why? What have you guys, what, what's your culture? What's what, What's the thing that, that it would draw them to you? Uh, I would say um, like we do have a real performance-oriented um, culture. That's, and and that's, it's hard um, back to the beginning of the session. You're both mad sportsmen, right? So it's that that competitive nature. And and by the way, Phil, when you're nodding, it doesn't translate to podcast. <laughs> Sorry, hey, <laughs> don't want to don't want to big note my athletic prowess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not much of an athlete. I must be honest anymore. Um, but no, no, we do. We, we've got a real performance oriented culture. But at the same time, we've got a flexibility that I actually don't think you'd see. Pretty much any other advice. Okay, so flexibility. Um, tell me about it. I, I can tell you the starting point of that, which yep. was when I was starting off as an employer. I was like, "What do I have to offer these people?" That's exactly right. Yeah. What, what? What? There's nothing. Like, where's the progression? It's me and you supporting me. Well, you, you're either taking me over, or where are you going? So, it was flexibility. It was you need a day off. You need to work from home. You want to change your hours? No worries. And this was pre-COVID. Absolutely. Like okay. this would have been oh, really from day one. I mean, Jerry said no staff. I mean, I always kind of shared a receptionist with a couple of other businesses and, you know, that attitude prevailed with them too. So flexibility is um, is uh, of working around people you have in the same life stage. Uh, Luke, the average age of advisor in Australia, I think, is about 47. But based on the statistics, it's come down. In, in, in years, I think that's... Um, yeah, we, uh, we've got a much younger team than that. Yeah. So, what, so where, uh, where do you guys sit? So, uh, well, firstly, I'd say our, our two CSMs, they're both in their 20s. Yep. Our advisors are early 40s. Um, I'm 47. Oh, there you go. He's 47 <laughs> and, and I'm 45. So, yeah, we're, we're all a fairly young team. But, um, yeah, on the flexibility young. front, well, I, I feel young. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I said that to one of the twenty-year-olds the other day. It was oh, they're a bit young. They're young like us. And she looked at me like, "Don't include me in the the royal we." You know, <laughs> yeah, we're old. I'm young. I um, I but my one of my workmates. Uh, she said, "Oh, my mum's birthday on the weekend, and uh, she's the same age as me." And I'm just like, "Oh yeah, there you go." Hey, so, uh, but so flexibility. Yeah, um, flexibility. and 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 two two old guys hanging out with the young kids being cool. I get that. Yeah, so it's me too. To the extreme though. So we are so sort of results and, and performance oriented that flexibility becomes um, pretty much whatever you want it to be. So, you know, one of our CSMs, he's in his early um, 20s. Late and 20s. Oh, now. late 20s, sorry. Yeah. Now. Um, and Marcus's family, you know, they're expats. They moved to Dubai or somewhere similar um, and the whole family moved. Now, that wasn't an issue for us. So, he still works for us. He's currently living in Thailand, but doing – and he clocks onto that 12th. PM call every day. The work yep. gets done. It's it's awesome. Um, Bridget that works in our office as well, mid twenties. Phil saw her for the first time in the office this year, uh, a, about a week ago. So yeah, we're entirely agnostic as to as to where so, you work. So you mentioned your performance orientated. How do you like maybe answer the question in in current state and what you're proposing as you grow? So um, how do you measure success for an advisor? And um, have you have you structured any? I know Phil, it's it's, it's your business, so probably not as much. But for, for ARs coming into your business, have you structured a performance sort of uh, bonus system that sort of thing? You don't have to go into details, but just be- look, they they will judge their own success really because of the structure we've set up. You know, we bring them in because we need some support and some help, and then create an incentive structure that if they 
find clients, seeing, yep. see clients. It's limitless. So if they bring in new business is an obvious one. If they if they enhance your current business and you know uh, I- increase the scope of engagement with existing clients, that sort of stuff. Yeah. What about your back office? What do you, how do you um how do you sort of like create a performance culture for people who effectively sometimes are order takers, right? So how do you uh, build in a structure where they can their discretionary effort gets rewarded? Well, it, for me initially, it's I encourage them to step up the rungs. You know get their qualifications, do the study, we'll fund it, almost force feed them that. Say, even if you don't want to do it, let me pay this cost for you. And there's your second thing, flexibility, backing training. There you go. Yep. And and for people coming through now, if you do a, if you see a survey of the top 10 things um, people want in their employer of choice or, or destination, I think training development might be first or second every time. But I also say to them, listen, I, I know you're doing an admin job. This may not be for your forever job. If I get five years out of you, I've probably done well. But you know what? Let me train you up in the meantime. It's only going to help you in the next job if you decide this isn't the one for you anyway. So get a qualification, whether that's some financial, well, it'll be a financial qualification. And if you then want to progress that to starting to be an advisor and a PY year and all the rest, great. That's where you're heading. If you don't want to do that, you can stay in your current role or you might go elsewhere and take that. That's part of the, I guess, the gift of what we give you while you're here. And specifically back to advisors looking to join you um, and, and to tap into that platform. And it sounds like the sort of advisors who would be attracted to you guys are ones that probably don't like doing the administration organization and, and like generally the passion of being very good with clients. Um, would you ultimately, once they come in, would, would things like um, uh, you know a sh- share of profit or, or equity or anything like that, is that on the horizon at all with, with you guys? Well, I think it already is to an extent with the advisors that we work with. So in terms of a share of profit for clients that they source, that's absolutely on the table. Perfect. Yep. Um, we also have a unique scenario at the moment with an advisor we've put on where we're experimenting with this concept of an advisor actually running their own business within our business. So but Talk uh, to me. How does that work? Is it under the same brand? Under the same brand, um, seeding that advisor on day one with a salary yep. and helping them acquire a book which they will entirely own. So we will not have a share in anything he acquires. But from that point onwards, obviously the salary stops and then it's a profit, uh, then it's a a revenue share scenario where we're doing all of their back office work. But you've plugged them in, right? They they couldn't do the thing without your back office and whatnot. Um, And And also the economies of scale, I guess, you know, cheaper licensing, which we're covering and, you know, all all of the infrastructure. Love it. Love it. And you solve, what happens is, at the end of the day, we're all going to make money if we solve problems. If you're solving that problem, then that solves a client problem. That, that's, that's the reality of it. So, And also, not everybody that's a great advisor wants to run a business or take that risk or does it very well, to be honest. I mean, that's what I saw early on. I learned all my lessons by watching two guys do what you probably shouldn't do in terms of running a business. So helping people just do what they want to do, but still having some ownership without some of the risks. Well, the fact I'm interviewing two people in your practice right now, one who's the lead advisor and one who's the the lead operations person means that at some stage you actually made the conscious and financial decision that you can't do both. Every practice that I've interviewed and seen over the years, um, sometimes, like in my own experience, I realized that um, although I was the lead advisor, I was best... If I became the, uh, the 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 person who ran the business of the business and left to be advising up to better advisors and shout out to all those guys and girls who are great advisors in my practice, whereas some people such as yourself have gone, well, I, I'm really passionate about advice. I'm going to bring in that capability. So oh, getting Jerry on board has meant instead of all those things piling up that we knew we needed to do, he's just proactive with it. So that checklist doesn't pile up anymore. There's a checklist and he gets onto it and it's done. And so- it just creates opportunities. How do you guys have, like, yes, you're flexible. Yes, you're not in the same place and you're meeting people for the first time. How do you recreate the social fun part? Well, that's that- a, I mean, well, we're going out tonight. Funny you should mention that. We're going out for a birthday thing tonight. But you're right. Maybe the social part relative to other businesses is not as much of a priority. You're absolutely right, though. I think, um, you know, we all talk daily on Teams, so we're interacting constantly. But rather than that one-off, let's go out for lunch today, it's those micro-interactions throughout each and every day. Um, my, my attitude has always been, all these guys, we work together all day. The, the time they want to have for social events, it's probably not 
quite so much. Let's all hang out together again and, and have drinks every every night. They want the time to go out with their mates and with oh. their family. So uh, for me, we don't do as much of it in-house. It happens. But the time we're giving back to them and and that freedom is t- to be able to go and, and do those social well, things. Well, I'll, I'll reframe the question. When you hit your target um, for about a quarter or a year or something like that, how does the company celebrate that success? Because you know, back in the old days, you'd all be in the one room and and um, you know, someone would get up and say, "Well, congratulations! Here's a whiteboard. We've just crossed off the eleventh thing we wanted to do." So, how do, what how do you recreate that? And and what are your ideas around that? So, I do. I think that is important. There are two parts to that answer. One is our offshore team celebrate in a big way. Um, I'll let sort of Phil describe what that looks like, and it is pretty pretty unique and sometimes a bit extreme. I think in terms of how um, Justin, our um, sort of managing partner over there, deals with things. But in terms of the onshore team. Time out, time out. That's what you really want <laughs> so, to So, uh, yeah, yeah, tell us about well, Justin's parties. Well, right. it's just different culturally over there, right? Like they really are looking to work together as a community and are very, very tight. Well, working for a good quality employer is quite prestigious. Absolutely. Hmm. So, I mean, over there it's all about, I guess, the image and, hey, look at us all out and the fine dining and the social media and the snaps and the, you know, I guess appearing to be very successful. Whereas I feel like on Australia, it, we don't want to be quite that gaudy. You don't really want to f- flash, well, I don't, flash wealth around and drive a Ferrari down the main street. So, But we're it, talking about a country that was, was in our lifetime communist. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is their first real generation of, of that. And that's a quite an uh, important stage in their development as well, you know, as far as being proud of their education, being proud of their achievements, yeah. encourages younger people to do that as well. And, and over time, hopefully one day, They'll, they'll be in that mature. And we have to encourage, I guess, that integration of cultures. I mean, we had a big video hookup with the whole team yesterday. And, yeah, it's trying to get everybody talking and communicating. They're a little more subservient and don't want to speak out of turn. Whereas Jerry and I are on the other end of the line saying, hey, guys, you know, who's, who's, who's going to give us their input, their feedback? Who wants to speak up? So part of that is an ongoing education to them to say it is okay to to tell us what you think to talk up where we do it slightly differently here. Well, it's massively it's just a cultural difference. It is. It, it's a cultural thing. And look, the guys have a good time there. They, in terms of celebration, end of year, they do. They work really, really hard throughout the year. But you know, Justin's taken them on two overseas trips so far. Mm. Uh, one to Thailand last year, and they were out here in Oz the year before that. Oh, wonderful! Um, so fully funded trips for the whole team, basically. Um, and yeah, they've got an awesome um, bonus structure as well. So they they celebrate uh, better than we do. And I, I think if you were over there, you'd see a different picture too, because we actually had Marcus go and live and work over there with them for a few months last year. And he was like, you know, you wouldn't believe what Alice is like outside the office. She's a you know party, party, party. And yet, what we see is this demure, hardworking, respectful young lady. Um, so I think, yeah, we're, we're, we probably see the, the business-like side and fair play to them. They go out and have a good time outside work. Um, so I've, I've gone through and, and asked some questions about the, the fun side of that. Jerry, you sort of like, you were nodding going, yeah, it's one of my things I might want to do a bit more of. And as, and as uh, thanks, Kieran, the sound guy, I was talking not into the microphone. You can edit that out, mate. You won't, <laughs> bastard. Um, so the what I'm after now is, so... 18 years, Phil, is that right? 14? 18 years, 18? yeah. So 18 years overnight success for me. For me, for me, for me and, and once you get quite successful, you're the lucky guy. I understand how all that works, right? It's graft. It's learning from your mistakes. But your moment is now as a business, right? Off air, you've, we were chatting a month or so ago and, and, and you've brought Jerry into this role. Um, you've spending some capex on building capacity. So what's the vision for Aptium as far as – where do you if I was to do this interview in a year's time, where do you hope that your business has got to? Who wants to start? Uh, I can start from day one, which was me saying it would be great to get to a corporatized kind of model. What does that mean to you? It means the business would continue on beyond me. Great. So that whole concept that you're my advisor and I only speak to you needs needs to go. How many years do you think that'll take that transition? Oh, I think we're close to it. I mean, that's that's already happening, you know, from when Pete came on and reviewing clients like in year one, 
uh, having gone from never advised to client, Pete, I think reviewed 170 odd clients in in one year, right? From from a standing start, so that demonstrated absolutely to me that the world will keep turning beyond me. But but knowing your personality, I doubt you're doing nothing with the extra time. What does it found? What has that leveraged you to do? I can tell you <laughs> that it's leveraged Phil to put on 52 <laughs> clients in the last nine months. That's yeah. that's absolutely opened his capacity. Oh, it's a good so, habit to have. Yep. Yep. So congratulations. He's he effectively has got more time to um to yeah leverage the networks that he's that he's got and every one of those new clients has come by way of a referral from an existing client. So it's not as though we've got a referrer supplying this endless stream of clients that just doesn't exist for us. It's just a pool of clients that we do good work for that tend to refer everybody that they know. So so in a year's time, um, you you're decayed yourself, um, but you're still rain making. Okay. Um, are you looking to build a, a lot bigger advice footprint? Because there's going to be advisors listening to this, um, hopefully. Hopefully, they're, they're listening to this. Um, and the great thing about these podcasts is they get a bit of a free look at you. Mm. You know, they get to listen to you for quite some time. And, and when they do reach out, and many of them do, they're reaching out because they, they genuinely like what you're about. Um, are you open to uh, growing your AR numbers? You mentioned you've got someone coming in with their own business, hub and spoke approach. What's what's the one that you, you, you what are your priorities? Well, that's what it is for me. I mean, my involvement in the business will be just continuing the organic growth. We want to support other people to come into it, and that will be more that acquisitive go- growth, I guess. If they've got plans to to come in and either you know support our business that's pre existing, or have the ambition to uh, bolt on something they already have or make acquisitions with which we could support them. So, I, I mean, that's really limitless as yeah. to how that could could go. But you're providing the, the hub, right? So, and um, and with, with acquisitions, um, do you guys have a, a, a really positive lending association? Like who, 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 uh, who do you lend the money with? NAB, Judo, Macquarie? Have you got like one that no, no one? No. You, well, anyone out there who wants to lend some money to a quality practice and uh, not dick them around with six months worth of applications, <laughs> reach out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no there's no uh, debt in this business to begin with. Uh, so there's no acquisitions we've made that that um, we're dealing with. But but your future but that, state is. But that said, yeah, mm-hmm. the future state could be very very different. So we are actively exploring a couple of different options around that, and obviously we're part of a big licensee community where. Uh, that activity is, is really, really prevalent, right? So I think over the course of this year, options within our licensee community will be broader um, as things sort of develop there without going uh, into too much there. Uh, but also outside the licensee community, from a um, funding point of view, there are lots of options. You know better than most, Roxy. Just yeah, well, there's, how there's many... debt, there's equity, there's, there's partnerships. There's... Absolutely. <laughs> and we're not waiting for... Um, uh, the hand to be dealt to us. We're actively exploring these options as we speak. And over a reasonable period of time, I think we'll make some good decisions around um, the right avenue for, uh, of growth for us and how to how to fund that. And for all those uh, listeners, um, uh, the best way to get yourself in a position where you have choices, whether it be lending or private equity or capital, is the following. To do what Phil's doing to make yourself DK. If you're a business where 80% of all the revenue is written by the, the principal, that's a great job, okay? And you're probably doing well, but it's it's hard for someone to come in there and, and buy that as a going concern. So that's your first step. And that you've got to try and do that whilst not going into the actual J-curve. So um, the second one um, is profit. You, you, you know, we sometimes get carried away with hopium in our, in our industry where we spend money before we make it. And we then um, make some money and then we quickly spend that again. Um, and we don't look long and hard enough about a, a steady, consistent profit. Um, and that's that's a big facet of our business. So from a profitability perspective, would you guys say that you're a, a reasonably percentage profit business? I, I sat in uh, to uh, I sat in with a, a recent sort of um, uh, 10x, uh, something that CFS put on, um, advisor session and I think it was Sue who, who you know really well Roxy Sue Viscovich that was talking about what profitability looks like in the advice world you know moderate really good and excellent was, was um, something like 40% mm-hmm. um, profit and I, I would say we're quite a bit north of that Fantastic. so I, from what I saw there I would describe us as a bit of an outlier um, and that's a good place to start in the sense that what we've built is scalable we could plug anything in and basically maintain that level of 
of profit. Which well, that's is, very interesting to third parties. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with the engine room, with with ensemble. So, um, the whole reason I kind of was convinced, and my arm twisted to do this a couple of years ago, was that um, I was an advisor for many years, and I would have loved to have had the ability to listen to my peers. And in fact, the only time I ever got to hear about other good businesses was between five o'clock when the conference finished and 7.30 when everyone was too drunk to make any sense of um, once or twice a year, right? And every time, I would love those times and I'd finish my conference and I'd go and all my notes were around who were the other peers to to ring up and talk more about, right? So, so we're promoting practice management here. Is there any, you know, where do you see the future of like practice managers, general managers in financial services? Is this to you, Jerry? That's a, that's a really tough question. I unfortunately had... Um uh, the displeasure of reading some research that Rod Bettino and Business Health published recently around the current level of satisfaction of practice managers. Presumably, I think it was practice managers employed by licensees, mm-hmm. and it was not a great degree of uh, job satisfaction. So, they're not uh, satisfied. Correct. Is that correct? Because why do you think that's the case? Let's let's head down this rabbit hole. Uh, I would say that- you, You've been on that side of the ledger. It, I mean, I saw your role morph from being really, really proactive and trying to help me with growth to becoming a bit more of a compliance manager and ticking boxes. Oh, really? Absolutely. I think that's a consistent theme in big licenses. You're the undercover cop. Yeah, that yeah, the practice managers very much have been directed in, in the last few years more towards compliance. Um, I, look, it's it's tough, right? Licensee land is, is, is a tough place to operate in and make money in. And I think working as a practice manager where the concept is you're a value add, right, to to practices, it's really challenging where what you want to work on, which is focusing on growth and helping helping people run better businesses, you know, your priorities have shifted and you've got different demands um, on you. So, yeah, I'm not sure that it's as happy a place as it used to be in the good old days, let's say. Um, but what does the fa- uh, future practice development look like? I think I can see a shift um, as sort of licensees have been the traditional suppliers of that sort of service maybe focus on slightly different things and the provision of that service maybe shifts to other places, be it product providers, um, be it consultancies, um, you know, the, the elixirs of the world and so forth, um, or brought in-house. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, there's uh, the, the wealthiest entities in our ecosystem are the product providers and for years they had no, they, 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 they didn't bother because they didn't have to and they over-relied on the licensees to, to do that and that worked for a period of time. And then the tide went out. So um, I'll call it the, if you're a financial planning business and you want to move to an enterprise or you want to have an ability to have a succession plan and a head of operations or practice manager or COO or whatever you want to call them is not on your roadmap, you're mad. Okay. Well, and, and then once you do that, you've got to empower them. We see it with, I mean, that's why Jerry's here with Aptium Assist Offshore. The only way we can make that grow with existing businesses is it requires business planning and practice development. Mm. If you just try to plug that in on the side, all it's going to be is an extra cost and not used properly. So the first step with every business we talk to is Jerry and I getting in there and saying, well, what's your staffing like? What are your expenses like? And, you know, what are they doing actually day to day? And who's... And doing all that planning to say, right, well, this this is how this could work. You know, do this, and you're going to save all these costs and become more efficient. So, and, and they believe you because you've done it, right? Yeah, we try and demonstrate yeah. it. I, I mean, that's the pressure I feel, and I've said this to Jerry. My only real pressure I feel is to continue being successful, so that he's got something to demonstrate. If I if it ever doesn't work, then yeah, we're in a bad place. Oh, awesome. Well, the um the the other the other couple of questions I wanted to ask was um. You are kind of, you mentioned you were guinea pigs, but your own firm is a guinea pig for your offshore capability as well, right? So, and vice versa. So, I think collectively by seeing what other people do and the best bits of what they do and learning from that is actually what's going on today as well. So, if you know, we don't need to compete against each other. It's impossible. It's, financial planners don't run into each other in competition for a client. It no, just doesn't happen. Absolutely no. not. And yeah, we, we've got strong convictions around what we do, but we hold them pretty loosely, so to speak. So we don't think everything we do is right. We'll absolutely drop something and pick up something new if we think it, it's going to solve a problem in a better way. Um, and we do. We learn from other advisors as well. But, but And yeah. we, we know they don't see us as competitors because even the advice we're producing offshore, these advisors will often copy me and CC me in on 
advice documents and questions around strategy because even though I'm running a, a similar business, they, they see it as absolutely no threat. I suppose one of my final uh, questions, and I'll start with yourself, uh, Jerry, and maybe get Phil to, to back end. We've gone through a lot today, and I knew that this would go longer than normal because um, you've, you've got the unique situation where you're not only a practice in an engine room, but you're also doing engine room work for other practices, right? So it's kind of, I get a two for one. Um, it's almost as if I've done this podcast twice. If I was to ask, if people are listening to you now and um, go, I like what these guys are about, first of all, we're going to give all the links, okay? So anything they've spoken about, we're going to give all the links, the, the Optimus Assist, Optimus Assist, sorry, your own business, et cetera. But what, do you, what are you in the market for at the moment as far as people? So our call to action really would be that anyone that is interested in running a more efficient business, um, feel free to get in touch where we are open for business in a variety of different ways. So whether it be that, you know, outsourcing something you've never done before, but you're interested in having a chat, that's great. Whether you're an advisor that loves seeing clients, but doesn't love the rest of running an advice business, um, absolutely get in touch. Um, you know, flexibility is absolutely something that's core to what we do. So we will consider everything and, and happily have a chat. Um, so that's, the, yeah, that's my that's my take on it. And Phil, it's the same thing for me. And, you know, t- tap on our, our door if you're interested in just a bit of practice de- development advice. I mean, that's what Jerry's here for. You've got uh, visibility over quite a range of businesses. And so if nothing else comes of it, you're going to be able to pick our brains and we'll tell you how you how you compare what you're doing well and areas where we think you could improve. Well, if the last hour or so has been an indication of your willingness to share, then I think that, that um, if anyone does knock on your door, you'd be very generous with your time. And with that, guys, I'd like to thank you for being part of The Engine Room. Um, Ensemble's all about the positive evolution of financial advice. And I think today's session has been another great example. Thank you very much, Jerry and Phil. Thank you, Roxy. It's been a pleasure for your time.